Yeah. Nate, do you still need me to read the preamble regarding mm -hmm. Zoom? Okay, so I have that yeah. on a different piece of paper. So that comes first. Yeah. And then the um, legal document that you sent me. Okay. So uh, um, we're ready to go. Yeah, except we meant the attendees are still joining, so. Okay, just wait, wait a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, just wait a minute or two. I just wanna see if Pat was in the audience. Mm. There's a lot there. Oh. That's quite a big number of people. Where's Pat? All right. I see there's a hand raise. We're not, we're, um, we're gonna, we have to open the hearings first and then we can start taking some comment. Okay, so we're ready to open the meeting? Yeah, I think it looks like, uh, I'll just try everyone's um, knowledge that, you know, um, there's 30 attendees. And so, you know, the way we set up our Zoom forum, there's, it's a webinar, so attendees can't see each other. The panelists, the historical commission and myself can see who's an attendee, but there are 30, 30 members of the public here. So I just wanted to let everyone know that. Okay. And this is being recorded. Okay. So it is 6.39 PM and we are opening um, this September 14th uh, meeting of the Amherst Historical Commission. Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GLC 30A section 18 and pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 2022 20, of the acts of 22, 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 14th, 2022 and signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This uh, public meeting and public hearings of the Town of Amherst Historical Commission are being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The hyperlink to the hearing is posted on the town's online calendar. Um, now I'm going to open, we have two public hearings this evening, so I'm going to uh, open them uh, by reading our legal notice here. Um, in accordance with the provisions of Article 3.60 of Amherst General Bylaws, Preservation of Historically Significant Buildings, the Amherst Historical Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, September 14th, 2023 at 6.35 p.m., to consider the following demolition requests. Uh, 43 Amity Street, Jones Library, requ request to demolish the rear 1990s additions to the 1928 structure. In accordance with sections 3.1 and 3.2 of the preservation restriction agreement between the trustees of the Samuel Minot Jones Memorial Library and the town of Amherst, the Amherst Historical Commission will hold a public hearing today, Thursday, September 14th, to review the following major alteration per Exhibit F, standard restriction guidelines, uh, and then 43 Amity Street, Jones Library, request for changes to the site, including tree removal, changes to the building, including demolition of the rear 1990s addition, and replacement with new expansions and changes to the 1928 structure, including new roofing material. So with that, both public hearings are open and we'll begin, uh, I think we're beginning the presentation uh, on the project, is that correct, Nate? Sure, if anyone um, is here for the library, um, 
raise your hand and we'll promote you to panelists so then you can help with the presentation. Um, Nate, do you want to share that Google document that I shared with you? I just wanted to share that with our um, commission members and read it so that we have an understanding of how all the different um, regulations break down in terms of this project while we're waiting for our panelists to yeah, sure, sorry, the presentation ready. I have a lot of notifications right now. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> It can wait too, it doesn't matter. So um, Sharon or Ellen, if you see someone who's here, I, okay, I, I see more hands are being raised. All right, Robin, um, do you want me to share the screen as you asked? Um, yeah, not so I'm not, I'm, so I apologize. I'm on, yeah, if you can share the document, not my screen. Right. Um, Cause I'm on my Zoom on one device and my computer on another. Okay, great. So um, for uh, both commissioners and uh, members of the public attending, um, there's a lot of information that's gonna be covered in this hearing and there are a lot of different mechanisms um, that impact the Jones Library in terms of um, historic preservation. So I just wrote this up quickly to give everybody a sense of how things break down. So for the demolition permit hearing, the Historical Commission has powers to allow for the approval of a demolition permit or the imposing of a demolition delay of up to 12 months. Um, so that's only a delay, we can't stop demolition. Uh, the demolition relates only, uh, this particular demolition uh, permit request relates only to the 92, 93 non-historic portion of the building. That 1992-93 portion of the building is excluded from the preservation restriction, which we'll be dealing with separately, but it's not part of the preservation restriction. Uh, impacts from the demolition process to the historical portion of the building can certainly be considered during discussion and decisions about the demolition should, as Nate said earlier, should be made on the basis of the demolition's impact on the overall historic building's historical significance and integrity. Um, for the preservation restriction hearing, uh, the preservation restriction does require that the Historical Commission approve any changes or impacts to the exterior of the historical portion of the building. Um, it does not require historic comm Historical Commission approval for interior changes, but the Historical Commission may make advisory comments on these changes. Um, any work approved by the Historical Commission that is later changed before um, construction is undertaken would require approval again before another meeting of the Historic Commission. Um, additional review that's outside of our um, purview, but that will impact this project depending on um, whether um, tax credits are granted. The Massachusetts Historic Tax Credit process requires review by the Massachusetts Historical Commission of the, I believe of the entire scope of work and they can correct me if I'm wrong um, before the, the, the tax credit can be approved. And if the library project applies for federal tax credits, um, that would require review by the National Park Service, again, of the entire scope of work. So um, the interior changes may also, uh, there may also be um, commentary by both uh, the Mass Historic Commission and the National Park Service 
Um, so keep that in mind as we um, hear about this project. Thanks, Nate. So um, usually we have applicants make a presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen. So if um, if there's anyone missing from your team first, you know, there's, um, is Tim Alex, does he need to? Yep. Yeah, please bring him in. Thank you. All right. And then screen sharing should be enabled. So I don't know if there was, if who would, uh, if someone wants to try, if there's a presentation you'd like to make. So Nate, if it's, if it's okay, um, my name is Austin Sarrett. I'd like to start. Is that okay? Sure. So my name is Austin Sarrett. I'm a member of the Jones Library Board of Trustees, and I have the privilege of chairing the Jones Library Building Committee. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to do what we're going to do tonight. We really look forward to your review and, um, and comments. Before turning this over to the um, architects and the people have been working on uh, what I regard as a quite compelling design for the library. I just wanted to to remind you of uh, what I think you already know, which is the background of this project. Uh, the, the trustees more than a decade ago recognized that there were significant deficiencies in the Jones Library building, in particular in the 1993 edition. More importantly, we recognized that there were certain things that we wanted to do to serve the residents of Amherst and the people that visit the library that we were not going to be able to do within the envelope of the historic building and the 1993 building. We were driven by uh, a, a very careful assessment of the library's programs and the library's needs. And we sought to design a project or develop a project that would ensure that those programmatic needs could be met both now and into the future. That program includes adequate space for children, adequate space for teens, um, more ample reading rooms, and it provides the space necessary for our award-winning win English as a Second Language program. So that's what we're about. We didn't start out with the idea that we wanted to renovate or demolish anything. We were driven to that conclusion by a careful, by a careful assessment of the program and the needs of the library. We then went through a, uh, a process of soliciting bids and inviting architects to submit their bids. And we had a rigorous examination of what those architects proposed, but more importantly, in this context, a rigorous examination of their record. And one of the things that we looked for was we looked for an architectural firm that had a demonstrated rec record of successful renovation of buildings, but also of historic preservation. And we chose Feingold Alexander, not only because of the vision of what our library could be to meet our programmatic needs, but because of their demonstrated record of success in historic preservation. So where are we now? We are halfway through construction documents, anticipating another cost estimate in October. We hope to go out to bid in December. Our contract with the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, which has given us a substantial state grant to help underwrite this project, requires that we sign a contract with a general contractor no later than June 30th of 2024. Tonight, we're here to talk, as you indicated, Robin, about the exterior designs of the building, and in the first instance, about the plan to take down the 1993 edition. We're joined by uh, colleagues from Feingold Alexander, the Berkshire Design Group, and from Colliers, our OPM. So with that, I want to turn it over to um, FAA, Tony, Ellen, Tony, I'll let, yes. I'll, I'll let Tony start and Josephine's going to share the screen. Thanks for uh, inviting us and taking the time to meet with us, everyone. Thanks, Ellen. I um, appreciate this and appreciate everyone's time tonight. Um, my name again is Tony Shaw. I'm a principal of director of design, Fango Alexander Architects. And I think Josephine, whenever you're ready, 
we can begin to share. I'm not currently able to share screens. I don't know, Nate, if you could give me access. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine. Um, so this first um, portion of the presentation tonight is dealing with the demolition review for the 1990s edition as has been discussed. Um, so I think why don't we just proceed and go next. So the way we've uh, done this uh, graphically is the areas that are identified in green. This is the 1927 historic uh, original library and is indicated that it is to remain. In the 1927, there are some elements that will be modified, which are gonna be pointed out. Uh, I know this might be a little hard to see uh, on the screen, but the areas that are called yellow are called out that way. And then the areas in red uh, in the original building that are to be removed are called out and highlighted as well. And so, as you can see initially in this first plan on the ground level, uh, and again, what is shown here in the green part is the 1927 portion is um, elements such as the existing uh, areas that are outlined in red, um, which I know is a little hard to read there, um, but this has to do with removal of the stairs, uh, in this case shown in outlined in that indicated area, uh, because we have to accommodate the new way to move to the library and create accessibility for staircases that eventually connect all levels. Let's go to next plan. And furthermore, as we look in a little more detail about these areas here, there are in further indications of other, um, sorry, other staircases. And there's the elevator that exists that is not to code, it's too small, that is also going to be removed. And then there are selective um, areas that have been identified uh, as indicated in the areas in red. Um, again, there are a lot of notes. I'm sure that many of you have already read through some of these details, but uh, these are the areas in particular that are of attention on the first floor. Uh, I will point out the other area that is indicated is the opening from the historic library into the new addition. Um, again, and Josephine, I'm gonna have you just hover your mouse over these areas, but that that is another part of the project because we have to create the way into the new addition. Um, and that includes opening up areas that are uh, some cases windows and other cases, uh, they, they were door openings, but or existing openings, but they're having to be widened to accommodate accessibility as well as connections through. Hey, Tony, could I interrupt? I think we're, we're supposed to focus on the, the the 1990s wing, not what we're doing in the, just to save yeah. folks time. Sure. So with respect to the 1990s wing, um, the areas that are really identified here, what is shown in this plan is really the night, is our proposed addition in white. And so that is why it's identified as a, as a white color. And the green color is, is simply representing what is there? We are taking down the the 1990s wing, uh, which is sort of overlapping underneath the air is shown in white. And as we continue going up through the building plans again, this is now at the um, second level here. Again, all the 1990s wing is being removed. Um, then the areas which impact the historic 1927 portion, again, it's just areas that are identified in red and any areas that have existing window openings, uh, we are also impacting in certain instances. In many cases, when they abut the new addition, uh, they might be on top of elevators or other areas. So we retain the openings and, and retain the, the, the window pattern, but behind it essentially will be a blind wall because it abuts at things like elevators and the like. And as we continue up to the upper level plans, again, just in the bottom plan, the third floor plan, again, the areas identified in red are the areas that are directly impacted in the historic wing. Again, mostly having to do with um, elevators and or stairs and then selective demolition or changes. And the elevation standpoint, this is where we particularly focus in on. So in the, in the front of the historic library, this is what you see as you approach the library from the, the main street as you enter it. The area in pink, that is looking to the left are areas that are going to be removed. That's part of the 1990s uh, current wing. 
and the proposed elevation just indicates how the new uh, design is being uh, added to and what is actually visible. Uh, and invisible, I mean, what is actually popping up behind the elevation, but in most cases, be due to perspectival issues, uh, these additions are really subservient or in many cases not visible when viewed from a perspectival view. On the side elevation here, again, the existing elevation is shown uh, in the black and white outline and the light pink represents the portion that's being taken down from the 1990s edition. And again, the proposed new uh, design is shown in pink that uh, organizes around the additions to the side and then the areas that, that pop up behind the historic building beyond. Uh, on the other portion, on the, this elevation here on the north, um, these areas of the 1990s wing are proposed to be demolished. And then the new design, because the new design essentially infills um, on this entire north elevation, uh, it is all new facade that you're seeing from the standpoint of the visibility from the back. So that is why this entire facade is all new. And then finally, as we come to the west elevation, again, the portion in pink is the, is the 1990s element that is take, proposed to be removed. And then again, the design for the new proposed addition outlined in pink uh, that is to the left of the existing historic 1927 uh, main library. And I think, is that the last? Uh, and then there are certain site um, issues, which I think I'm gonna let Rachel speak to these. Thanks, Tony. Um, so we're looking at the Amity side of, of the Jones Library from above. Um, there's an existing sidewalk along Amity Street with a crosswalk connection to the public parking lot. And then there are existing granite pavers leading up to the main entry and steps. So the main entry is not accessible today. Um, there are planting beds around the front of the library with um, lilac and roses and some other, other perennials. Um, and then we have an accessible ramp on the, on the eastern part of the south entry and angled spark parking spaces on the side. The next slide. And then on the north side of the library, um, part of that 1993 edition was to enable a, a rear entry into the library. Um, and they in that in that in that site work, um, the project before actually lowered the grades in the back area and, and dropped in the paths that are there. So are there bituminous paths? Um, there's a Kins the Kinsey Garden, which actually has plans to be relocated to the Kestrel Land Trust in South Amherst. Um, in this area, there's also a parking turnaround for vehicles who had maybe parked in those angled parking spaces. They have to drive to the back of the site and turn around in a turnaround space and then go back out. Um, the, and then to the north of the property is the CVS parking lot and where a lot of patrons actually park and, and walk into the library um, along the east side of the library. There are a couple existing shade trees um, that will need to be removed back here. In part one is growing into a clay sewer pipe um, and the pipe needs to be replaced, but also part of the addition um, really encroaches on the, on the root, um, root zone. And another tree is in the middle of our stormwater area. Um, we should note that the library parcel today receives a lot of stormwater from the historical society property um, and the future design will accommodate that as well. Next, next slide. So this is a similar view um, showing our proposed changes. Um, we now have an accessible patio area right at the front entry. So the patio meets the main entry flush with, pav with pavers. Um, we're incorporating Goshen stone walls along that edge. Um, some traditional, um, more traditional shrubs like uh, Cunningham white rhododendron, which is evergreen with beautiful white flowers. And we've um, introduced a new sidewalk parallel to the library, which provides that accessible access. 
it's under 5%, so we don't need railings. Um, it'll be really easy to maneuver, and it connects the front of the library to the parking area and out to Amity Street. We have reconfigured the parking area out front um, to have what we call head-in parking spaces, which allows you to pull into a parking space and back out um, without having to go wave to the back of the library. Um, we also are introducing trash, a uh, trash in, and recycling enclosure, which the library currently doesn't have um, to screen the trash and refuse on site. That access drive on the east side is now for pedestrians primarily and also meets accessibility requirements. Um, to the southeast of the library, we've carved out a children's patio area with an ornamental fence and um, really cool paving patterns based upon Birds of Amherst. And then on the west side of the library, there's an emergency egress sidewalk right near the pop property line that also meets accessibility requirements. Next slide. On the north side, we're introducing uh, a reading patio area on the north face of the building. This area incorporates um, tables and chairs and areas to sit and read or, or work. We also have a number, um, several Goshen stone benches that we're um, making from reused Goshen stone on site. Um, and then we have the rain garden area depressed down in the middle of the north north area with um, raised uh, cross bridges to the back to the main north entry. The next slide. So this plan that you see in front of me, sorry, the plan that we're showing you now just represents the your existing first floor plan on the lower level. And as we look at the revised design, the proposed plan here shows the changes in the addition that results in several of the development of the program. Um, I won't get into the details, um, but it shows expanding large things like meeting spaces, art galleries, collect special collections, and storage and support, as well as um, accessible um, toilets and other areas that are, that are part of the program for the new library expansion. Level one, this represents your existing floor plan. And the proposed floor plan uh, with the addition, essentially expanding forward the adult collection um, for both fiction, gathering area, new materials, the young adults and, excuse me, uh, the children and youth areas, as well as expanded reading areas, fiction collections and children uh, spaces, and then administrative areas for uh, the staff as well. This is your proposed, excuse me, your existing second floor plan. And the proposed addition here shows the additional expansion, uh, particularly the adult nonfiction areas in the new wing, as well as young adults and the uh, English second language suite of um, spaces. And then uh, reconstituting the front historic parts for adult reading technology and administrative areas. And then on the third and fourth plan, these represent your existing spaces as they currently are now. And the proposed uh, retains uh, largely the spaces um, off the third level plan from the uh, Goodwin room. And we have additional staff break areas. Um, this also shows the ability to connect with the new elevator and stair to create accessibility to this level, um, which is shown here. And then the proposed fourth floor plan uh, continues um, as is. So I think, is that the last of the slides, Josephine? It is, Tony. Okay. So I guess going up to any questions. Yeah, I was just gonna say that, um, it could be helpful to show, you know, what is happening with some of the exterior walls when they, when it's, you know, when the 
where the new addition is going on the first, second uh, floors, if you just go back there, um, I mean, I think really that's, um, for the demolition review, that's um, a concern of the commissions. Uh, I don't, you know, there's, um, I mean, obviously you're doing a, you know, removal of the additions in their, in their entirety. So uh, it's really about how, how does, you know, what's happening with the original structure. I don't know if you want so, to speak to that a little bit. Sure. Um, would it be helpful to go back to those first set of plans? I think, I know it's, it could be a little bit, um, Hard to Actually, read, I, think I, think these, to I think these plans are better. If if you, you, think you refer to this on the on the screen, it would be more helpful than the. Okay. Yeah. So if we go to the let's go to the first the lower level proposed plan, and I don't know if we if we need to enlarge it in any way, Josephine, because um, I, I depends on what each of you are looking on your screens. It might be a little small, but anyway, um, we'll try to um, talk it through. So on the garden level plan here. Um, what you're seeing is uh, the area that, again, I think I'll have Josephine cover her mouth if necessary. The addition, which basically touches the historic part, runs around the perimeter in that L sort of configuration there, and then it boxes to the back. So in this case, um, uh, I believe almost all of what's existing on the historic part largely remains intact as is. Um, and again, Josephine, if you want to point out any areas in particular that are directly impacted, such as additional openings. Um, why don't you go ahead and sort of point those out where we are impacting from the historic to the new? Um, so we have um, some original openings um, on this north wall here and um, an additional door here. Um, to your point, Tony, most of um, this line here of the L on the ground level um, as is remaining as is. Um, and so there, there isn't a lot. Um, we might actually, after we run through these, we might go back to those first sets um, of plans that show um, those original floor plans just so people can relate to what's... Um, yeah, uh, I, I think... Um... Let's Nate, it might be easier if people have a hard time following this because it, I know the the green plans, those historic ones. I think we're really zeroing in in areas that we should color code it. Um, if that's helpful to explain. Yeah, I mean, I I think the, the proposed plans, it, you know, if it was highlighted differently, would be easier to read. I think the other plans are just they're really large and there's a lot of a lot, you know, a lot going on. So I mean, you right. could try that as well, I guess, if you zoom in enough to make. Yeah, it maybe let's 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 for the sake of um, uh, let's attempt to do the the ones that started with. I know there's a lot of dense information there, but I think Josephine is the way. If we go back to those, and if we have to enlarge areas that zero in, I think that might be helpful to folks. Um, Can I just add one piece of information? So the existing building um, was modified. With the 1990s edition right and a lot of that a lot of the walls that were once exterior walls are now covered with uh plaster or gyp right so there's just there's just a couple of walls that are are the existing stone and uh and dormers that would be able to see because most of it is covered so there had been a number of modifications they took in in the um the wing, the section on the right, they took out which was a raised stage, and that there was a quite a few modifications in that wing. Uh, they at the the back of the historic wall. Can you just point that out, Josephine, where they had lowered? I forget. I apologize. They either lowered or raised the windows, and you can see that in the brickwork. So, just keep in mind this this facade that was a, the original facade was modified in the 1990s edition. I just wanted to, to throw that out to folks. And, and if you go in there now, you don't even know where it is because it's covered. Yeah, um, yep. we were, uh, we had a visit to the library um, last week and it was really interesting to be inside and um, not even realize where certain points of the edition began and started or to have that pointed out. Um, that's a good point. Um, so I think um, those are the areas that Josephine just uh, pointed out. And again, it's in the mostly in that 
North Ball at the rear there, where there are some selective uh, changes and openings for doorways and or windows as it's part of connecting to the new addition. But with the contents purpose, most of everything else is largely left intact on this level. If we go up to the next level, um, the main first floor level, <clears throat> So again, the areas that um, are that are being modified at the back, uh, those are the areas that are color coded in yellow. Those are the existing openings that are uh, being modified um, in some cases to create access and opening to connect through um, the library. And then the other marrying areas in the front, uh, which is right around the existing entry to currently your 1990s edition, we are expanding the width of that opening to create a much uh, wider excuse me, more accessible way to connect from the historic portion to the new library edition beyond. And that is right so, basically on center, yeah. Okay, so um, I just have a question or maybe more of a comment. I mean, it's sort of interesting because we're, we're, we're trying to, it's hard to tease these things apart. We're trying to address right now just that 1992 structure that's being removed and um, uh, the changes that you're pointing out um, well, on that interior, what's now an interior wall, I guess that will come under, um, I, it's a little confusing. Like those changes, I think, come under the preservation restriction and not necessarily under the demolition permit request, although Nate can correct me if I'm wrong on that. And then it, with the um, that north wall, that won't be impacted by the demolition of the 1990s section. So we can sort of take that north wall and say, let's move that over to the preservation restriction part of the, the discussion. I think it's just those interior walls that we're talking about. Um, and my only question from just from a total layperson's perspective is, wow, how do you take um, a section of a building that's non-historic away from this historic part very carefully? <laughs> um, so I don't know if anybody else else has that, you know, kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say it's concern. It's just more of a, a, a curiosity that, you know, is there the potential for any damage to any of the existing historic structure that's not part of the demolition, but you are pulling one part of the building away from the other? There's potential for that, but we will certainly have that, you know, covered in our drawings. So where they've, where they've attached the existing this addition onto the existing building, we may have to um, patch some of the the uh, you know historic facade that was once outside that is now within this '90s addition. So those there's some of that work that we have to um, deal with, but mm -hmm. we'll have on our drawings about protecting the existing um, building uh, as the as um, Austin noted earlier, we have done a lot of work on historic buildings, adding to them, taking pieces off. So we yeah. are very familiar on how to protect that building. Right. Um, so, so that's that that's high on our list. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, uh, I, I it was. It, that's why, again, I was just more of a curiosity question and mm -hmm. not an expectation that anything would go <laughs> drastically wrong. <laughs> um, and are those interior walls? Um, well, were the in, in ex when they were exterior walls, they were covered over. Will, will, will they be restored? Do I have that? Uh, do I have that correct? Are, do they exist and will they be restored as part of removing this structure? The exterior walls that aren't covered with with um, with plaster or gypsum. Mm -hmm. If they if they are covered, they will most likely remain covered. Okay. Right, and in other instances where they are not covered, uh, then they become part of the fabric yes. that actually one sees in the new edition. Right, right, yep. Okay. Um, is there any further questions about this level? Okay. I think then one more level up. Oh. 
So with respect, again, once the 1990s edition comes down, uh, the portion that has um, more direct impact is the areas that Josephine's colored mouse is hovering over. Um, so the opening from the 1927 through to the new edition is shown right there. That will be enlarged to create that access. And then a couple of the existing windows there will be blocked up because effectively we have program elements like elevators and other things which are going to be in front of it. But the retention of the openings themselves will remain intact. So this is on the, the second floor second where you're basically floor. looking, if, if you're at those windows, you're looking out over that pointed atrium. That's correct right now. Yeah. Uh, Patty, looks like your hand is raised. Yes. Um, this, uh, again, more from a lay person's perspective, but I'm just wondering how the elevator that's doesn't meet code anymore, and the two staircases that are highlighted in red in the original 1928 building, how you get those removed, and does it happen at the same time as the demolition of the 1992-3 edition, or not? I can answer that, Tony. I, I think, Eddie, that, that falls under... Um means and methods with the uh, contractor. But from my experience, the demolition of the 1990s wing is by a different contractor. What the work that we do inside will be done by somebody who is more delicate, I might say, with removal of historic elements. So it will not, it, mo most, my best guess, it will not be the same time. But again, that's up to the contractor in the end. Even though, sorry, this is a follow-up. Even though, I, I know those are internal features and I'm not supposed to be addressing that, but I don't know quite else when to ask that question. It's just, it's just. I, I guess I'm having the problem that Robin had of sort of trying to unpick the demolition from the preservation restriction at this point to look at those changes that are being made on the second, on the currently the second floor. And I was on the tour and I do I do understand what the issues are there from a design perspective in terms of accessibility. Um, but I'm just I'm just, again, sort of a bit confused, I guess. Yeah, I think maybe a helpful way to think about it is if you if we were to think about the demolition of the addition, if we were to imagine only that process happening because that's really what we're weighing in on now is just the demolition of the addition. So anything that doesn't happen concurrently with that um, wouldn't be part of this discussion. We'll have the other discussion later, but that's what I would suggest. Just think of, you know, if they, if they came in and they just removed the addition, um, what would our concerns be? Um, okay. So on this floor again, we've got the special fan light window in where is where Special Collections is currently located. And we've got, sorry, on the first floor at the back of the building, um, a sort of Palladian window looking out towards the north side of the building to the garden. Um, you, you mentioned, Ellen, that the guys the people doing that demolition are not quite as precise as the people who will take care of the staircases mm -hmm. and the elevator in the 1928 building. So, so talk a little bit, please, about how those windows that Jim said would be, Jim said the fan light window would be used mm -hmm. somewhere in the interior, which is awesome. Um, but just tell, just fill me in on. Sure. what these means and methods are. I guess I'm really curious um, of maybe, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't yeah. be, maybe I should just have faith, but I'm, no. I'm here to try and no. uh, make sure we have covered our, mm -hmm. everything's. 
no those are those are good questions Teddy. um so the the way that our that we would set up our drawings the window in the back which i believe is called the whipple window mm -hmm. um will be removed before it constructs so we're we're flagging that on our drawings this is to be removed in you know created and salvaged for reinstallation so that'll they'll take that out put it in a crate um in a weather protected area till it needs to be reinstalled the palladian window in the back mm -hmm. what we're doing on that would be because one of the things of the library is which is all libraries but especially amherst is 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 um view corridors in security right so the we, we need to open up as much as we can the the walls so people can see what's going on in the library. So what we're proposing to do with the Palladian window is on the center portion of that window, cut the windowsill down to the floor level to create a doorway. And mm -hmm. the two side lights will remain as one. And on the millwork, all the rest of the millwork will be retained. So this goes under more like selective removal. It's, it wouldn't go in the demo bucket on our drawings. If that, mm -hmm. if, if that helps. Yep. But it, helps. it is, it's, it's, it's very selective, but again, we're, we're, I hate to say it, but we're good at this because we've done it a lot. Yeah. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've done it a, a lot in my career. Um, but it, you, I hope that it helps answer your question. Yeah. Could you yeah. just put up briefly, put up that elevation that shows the Palladian window just so we can match it to your comments. Sure. Okay. Yeah, 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 right there. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I can't I figured out I can draw on Zoom, which is awesome. So what we would <laughs> be, be doing here, yes, um, <laughs> is that we can we're, we're gonna be cutting uh, it's hard to see in this. Josephine, don't we have an elevation of this somewhere? We did we anticipated this question. We do. Um, um, it's part of the other presentation, preservation. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. And if I can just jump jump in real quickly. So the Palladian window is on the existing um, north facade, which is not part of the demolition. The Whipple window is part of. Correct. Is, okay. So let's. Um, All right. We, good we, point. We, yeah. We, yeah. We right. could have another presentation on that because that, that's going to be really a lot of curiosity questions about how that wall looks on the inside, but we can yeah. place it aside for right now since we're, um, I wasn't sure, I couldn't remember where it was, which is why I asked for the elevation. So no, great. Thank you, great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. great questions, Hetty, too. I've forgotten yeah. about those pieces. Mm -hmm. um, are there other questions? And Nate, I just, because um, I'm on my iPad, I can actually, I cannot make my participant list show up along with the screen. So if anybody raises their hand, just um, know that I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I'm not sure we're there yet. We can always announce public comment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I guess if you just went through these drawings again and just talk, just to see, you know, what's happening at that junction with um, old and new, uh, in terms of like what's changing with the roof or side, you know, the siding as was mentioned, um, you know, I think with the for this demolition review, it's really right. How's the what's the impact? As Robin said, with removal of the '90s edition, and you know, although it seems like it's minimal, there are certain pieces that you know the commission's identified, and so you know what I'm hearing is sure, um, you know, if if things were to move forward, we want to have some conditions that you know, the fan light window was preserved. And so, you know, taking your word for it's one thing, but, you know, I would recommend that that becomes a condition of the commission's decision, um, possibly some other things. So I just want to make sure, you know, all the commission members, ha you know, understand, because I, I haven't heard a lot, too many questions, you know, and maybe we have some agreement um, and consensus first, but, you know, if you understand what's happening with like, you know, the exterior form of the existing library. So the roof where the new addition meets, 
I just want to make sure the commission understands it all before, uh, you know, we move on. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure yeah. that there's clarity right now from the commission members. So I just want to make sure we, we have that. Yeah, and I don't know. Um, I find the exterior elevations a little bit more helpful to visualize what's going away. And I think it, 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 the issue I think we're, we're seeing tonight is that we are overlapping a little bit between yeah. the two portions and it is, it is a little hard to, we're trying to be judicious in saying this stops here and then this continues to the next round. So, um, right. but forbearance on that. Um, but I think that the two key ones that I certainly heard with regard to the Whipple window and the Palladium window, those have the most probably direct impact on the um, historic 1927 library with regard to once the um, 1990s edition is demolished. There are other smaller, more modest openings that, that will be impacted, but that continues, uh, frankly, into the next aspect of preservation. So right. I, I think I heard really those are the two really significant ones. Um, I mean, or, you know, if you had, you had photos that you had sent, I mean, I feel like it would be helpful to walk through the photos and annotate in Zoom and show, well, here's, you know, here's what's, here's what's remaining and here's what's being removed. Um, I think that going through those images of the rear of the building and the two east and west um, facades would be would be helpful. And then, um, if if you like, Nate, I mean that is part of the next piece, and we we have existing photos. It's not unfortunately the way we structured this presentation is we tried to be very focused just on this aspect related to the 1990s. But if you want us to move portions of that into this part, we can do that. Well, yeah, so I, I was gonna share my screen in a minute. I just, I think that um, looking at those plans and everything is not, I don't, and I'm just not getting the sense that it's clarifying. And so for instance, um, you know, if we were looking, you know, if, if I'm sharing this part of the screen, right? you can annotate and zoom and it could be as simple, simple as saying like, okay, you know, all this is being removed, right? Or this is gonna be saved right up here, but that way it's clear to the audience and the commission what's happening, right? So, or all of this is being demolished. And I mean, it's, it's, it's like kind of a broad brush, but I think it's just a, um, it's easier than trying to look in um, plan view, for instance, because I think this this is to me a lot more legible. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think um, are you the one who's sharing this right now? Yeah, uh, but I, I just I, I just so what I just circled in orange is the 1990s wing that is being totally removed. Think of the existing building remaining, and we're scooping away gently, scooping away the 1990s wing, saving this Whipple window. Mm -hmm. So all of this is is will be gone, and I think you're right. It, this is a a good way to make it clear. And again, this piece over here, you know, this section of the original building remains, which will then become an interior wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I was gonna just open up. Maybe uh, I'll stop this share, and I'll open up one more picture. I was trying to get my computer there. Um, it open up a few. Yeah, no, I think just just so it's clear for um, everyone. And Hedy, maybe you, could, you have your hand raised. Maybe we can. There's a so, question. so does Antonia. So. Oh, okay. Um. Well, I you can go first, Hedy. But um, my question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, my question was on that window that you said would be saved. I was wondering how that was going to be incorporated um, in the new edition? We're going to put it in the the historic double height space. It, you know, when you get, you, do you know, I don't know what it's, the room's called now. It's going to, Josephine, do you recall what the room is now? It's, we had, we have a proposed as a main reading room. On the level so it used to be the historically it was the theater in the, in the, in the building. Yeah. 
and it's it's got a big you know vaulted the, ceiling yeah. yeah it will go it'll, it'll be located in there by adults right So this is fascinating, you know, I mean, the reason we're having these questions is because this is a building that was intended to fit with the historic building of 1928. I know it's got a lot of problems, this 1993 edition. Let's blame it on the fact that they're from out of state and they don't understand the Connecticut Valley and or whatever we decide. But I think... Um, you know, they're looking down at us and saying, hey, hey, <laughs> look, what you're trying to do now is to take away something that, you know, has until now, with all of its issues, been a problem um, to kind of pull away from. And and I'm just I'm just saying that because I know that there were other times in the history of this project, and this is not for FAA um, or the, any of the design people, um, it's really more for the town and the trustees. There were times in the history of this project when there were other options available that were not pursued. And I think we're struggling, or I'm struggling, let's not, you know, I'm struggling with some of these issues. But, and, and like Nate, I, I want to see these visualized, vi made visible so that it's clear what we're doing before we get into it. Could I just could I get, just say I'm sorry? Shouldn't we maybe look at the elevations again? I don't understand. Oh, are we going to mark up? Okay, well, we can mark up each piece. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, mean, I was going to say, like, you know, I have a few images. If we walk through them, and we could start, you know, if we go to the top, here's one we had looked at, and Ellen identified that, you know, everything here, right, really in the foreground, is the 90th edition. Will be removed except for that window and here's you know if you look at this again you know what's happening so you know what's happening with um, um with this this with this facade oh since we're all in the markup phase yeah it's a piece that goes away <laughs> and this piece of the building um will now be part of the inside of the new addition, which will be in front of it. And with regard to the Palladian window here, um, again, which we can get into the next round, but what we are proposing is that we are going to remove this portion to lower down because it's an accessible way from this historic part into the new addition. The rest of it, it essentially remains intact. Um, so it's, it's it's selective removal of just this opening here. And then the historic portion of this again, this becomes the inside face of the new addition once we add in front of this, if that makes sense. Right, so the brickwork, um, you know, the, the coins on the corner, mm -hmm. all that stuff mm -hmm. will be visible and, and remain. Yes. I see a couple of hands up, uh, Robin or. Yeah, um, I, I, my um, internet dropped out for a minute there while Hetty was speaking, so I caught the end of her comments. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just gonna speak to briefly to the fact, just to remind our commissioners that um, we are focusing on uh, whether the demolition of this 92-93 non-historic edition has a historic impact on the existing historic structure. So um, larger questions about uh, the library project overall um, are not um, are not part of, of what we're thinking about here. I just wanna, and we have two new members on our commission too. So I, I just wanna make that clear that we have a very specific targeted focus here and that we have an op opportunity to permit the Demolition. I think these, this doing the photographs is really great. We have an opportunity to permit the de demolition. We have the opportunity to delay it, but um, keep thinking about that. Just the removal of that structure and its impact on the remainder of the building. Yeah, 
Right. And so here, I mean, I don't know if, if we want to draw, I mean, I, I could, we could let the team do, I mean, here's the, you know, the, the older building and really what's being demolished is the new um, addition in the back, which I. Yeah. Basically from here. Right. Just in behind a tree, but that portion goes. Right. The tree stays just in case anybody. Uh, yes, the tree does stay. That's not going. All right. And then we'll go down just to the, I think the last one, um, the last image showing this area. So again, from this van, oops. Yeah. From this vantage point in this photograph, this part goes. And the historic part remains. And again, with a, a, a slight change in the palladium window portion here, you're opening this part up. But everything else is intact. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I, for me, that was helpful just to see it. Um, I know the plans can show it in more, you know, detail or accuracy, but I, I, I wanted this just so hopefully the commission members to also understand it a little more visually then. No, thank you. That's very helpful, actually. And you're allowing us to even mark up on your photos. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a huge benefit of, um, <laughs> of the Zoom that we can do that. And Yeah. Okay. Any other, any other questions? It looks like you have your hand raised. I'm not sure if you have a question. So typically after the applicant's presentation, we have a staff report. I don't have much to, to say. I, I feel like, you know, after walking through that, there, you know, there's pieces, but, you know, this isn't, you know, typically when you have a demolition review, someone's taking down the whole building and it's not as if it's a selective project or, you know, rehabilitation. And so, um, you know, there's, it's not as if we're, um, there's a lot happening to the original building. Um, so I don't have much, you know, to add. I mean, I think we know the significance of the library. It's, um, it's in a national register district. It's, uh, you know, it's a contributing structure. It's, it's, uh, it was designed, um, you know, specifically as, you know, say a, a small library, almost like a house. And so there's a lot there, you know, from what I've seen, a lot of that's not changing. So, you know, sometimes I have to go into what's happening, but I feel like that was pretty clear. So um, unless there's more questions from the commission, Robin, we could probably open it up to public comment. Okay. Um, I just wanted to specifically ask um, Michaela, Antonia, or Pat, if they had any questions or comments. I know that Antonia was able to make a site visit to the library along with Hetty. And I. Um, so if you have any questions, I've got to keep switching my view here. Um, I just want to say a quick comment. Yeah, I was I was not able to make the same site visit as you, but I did uh, get a tour of what the changes proposed were going to look like in front of it <laughs> in person too. Okay, great. That's great. Yeah, and I I sit as a liaison to the Historic Commission on the Design and Review Board. That's right. Yep. And and I also have been involved in in many many uh, presentations of the restoration. Um, so a lot of my questions were part of the Design and Review Board um, <laughs> that ha that really focused as much on the outside as we are concerned with the demolition question. And so I, I didn't have questions tonight, but it's because I've been through this presentation. Okay, great. Last, Thanks, Pat. Thanks last. for serving. I know that that's, that's a new thing that you're doing. That's great. <laughs> yeah, similarly, um, I was able to get a walkthrough and I was able to ask questions I had there while um, on the site. And one of my questions was about the window. So I'm glad that that was addressed. Um, and yeah, I don't have any further comments at this point. Okay, great. Thank you. So why don't we open up to public comment, Nate? And if you could manage that, just because I'm having issues with my screen. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone wants to raise their hand, 
uh, we'll we'll have um, some public comment. All right, Sarah, your hands raised. You're you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Nate. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. Um, I was a Joan, my name is Sarah McKee. I was a Jones Library trustee from 2009 to 2012 and was trustee president my final year. And I greatly appreciate the care with which the Amherst Historic Commission is considering this presentation. Um, I am also a member of the DC Bar and I am recovering from a stroke. So if my enunciation is not clear enough, I will not be offended if anybody um, asks me to repeat. Um, I, I think this request is premature. I think the point was very well taken um, about a demolition that might um, affect historic parts of the building. And indeed, it was interesting to see from the fine gold presentation that they identify historic parts of the um, parts of the historic building that are proposed to be changed. Um, because this is a state register property, it's on the state register of historic properties. And because there is a state construction grant, the library and the trustees accordingly have a particular responsibility for historic preservation of the 1920s library. They also have a contractual responsibility because of a term of their grant contract. And this is by law, they must give the Massachusetts Historic Commission the opportunity to identify all exterior, I think that would include um, that glorious Palladian window and interior changes that would constitute what are called adverse effects on the state register property. Then the what, what the library trustees and the town have never done, even though they were required to do this as early as possible in the planning stages of this project, is submit to the Massachusetts Historical Commission, the changes that they wish to make. I, I cannot, I cannot properly emphasize that this is a legal requirement. Um, and I have put the necessary um, citations in my letter. Um, as early as possible in the planning stages of this project was more than six years ago. I, I find it absolutely unaccountable that the trustees and the town have not fulfilled their legal responsibility to submit their materials to the Massachusetts Historical Commission and to participate in the public public consultation pro process to eliminate, mitigate, and minimize those adverse effects. So I would therefore strongly suggest that the Amherst Historical Commission defer any consideration of the changes that uh, the trustees have requested and that the trustees in town first submit their plans to the Massachusetts Historical Commission. By regulation, it is a pretty brisk process. And um, 
my understanding is that it would be that the Amherst Historical Commission um, would be favored if it would participate with that process. Thank you. All right, thanks. Are there any other public comment? Uh, now would be the time to raise your hand. Uh, just for everyone, the packet of information tonight has been uploaded online. It's um, it'll be it's been updated as public comments have been received today. So, on the historical commission webpage on the town's website, there's a link to packets. You have to scroll down through the folders, but on the September 14th folder, there's you know all the information that's been presented tonight has been uploaded and has been there for um, at least um, almost two weeks or a week and a half for, from everything that the architects have presented in the public comments. I think there's six letters. Some have been received, you know, since noon today and, or even later have been up, uh, been uploaded and emailed to the commission. So, um, but now is your chance if you're here to also raise your hand. All right, hey, Jeff, you can unmute yourself. Yep, thank you, Nate. Yeah, I'm Jeff Lee, I live in District 5, um, and I'm particularly concerned about the woodwork. I understand, um, I saw some comments in the schematics that millwork would be uh, would be altered. And the especially in the um, entryway area, the main entrance off of Amity Street, there's that beautiful staircase made of Philippine mahogany. On the right, there's the original director's office, which um, I really don't have an, I'm not clear on what the plans are for changes there, but there's some nice woodwork in there. I've been in that office. Um, on the third floor, there are the writer's cubicles that I understand are planned to be repurposed. Those have a quite a history themselves um, with uh, some of Amherst's notable writers using them to uh, as offices to conduct their writing. Um, and I'm also concerned about, I understand there's an elevator being demolished, is that right? And a new one being erected that um, uh, the new one, while it's not visible head on from Abney Street, it is, uh, you can see in one of the diagrams, it is visible from the uh, Eastern part of Amity Street as you're approaching the library. So the uh, Historical Commission may be concerned about that as well. So those are my comments, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Hilda, you can unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I would like to ask, when you take down the easterly staircase, which I think has some very nice woodwork too, what happens to that space? Is, does it become a big hole or are you going to put another staircase there? What happens to it? That's one question. And my second question is, um, are you going to have an opportunity tonight to talk about the design at all of the new structure or is that off the off the board for tonight. In other words, I, I I have some comments about the building that faces the street on the west side. The one that's on the by the strong house. So first of all, what happens to that three story space where the live where the stairs are going to be removed? The, these are the ones on the east side between the director's office and the east entrance. Are you allowed to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think usually we wouldn't engage in a back and forth. Um, but, you know, if those are your comments, Hilda, we can have the, um, you know, the consultants, the architects respond. Um, and I, I think to your second question, and also relates to your first, you know, we've opened the hearing hearings concurrently for both the demolition review and the preservation restriction because the information is overlapping. And so I think the... Um, 
what we can do is we can hear answers to those questions. And because it all, you know, there's overlapping material, this will be, you know, information for part of the preservation review. Um, but, you know, it's not specific to the demolition review. Okay. So if it, can I ask my second question then? Before you answer the first, or do you want to answer the first? I guess, I mean, I, 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 I'd like to hear the second question. Okay, the second question was, I find the roof lines of the new Gambro roof clash with the old roof lines. And I don't like the way that building looks on the street to begin with. It looks like a cow barn to me, but I expect to see the cows getting milk like in the olden days. But in any event, I think that if the lines of the roof gambro the angles mimicked the ones of the old building it would look less of a pastiche that's just a comment but I, I would like to know about the stairs what happens in that space where stairs are removed and you have a three-story hole all right thanks Zelda. Lose Nate. There he is. All right, and then um, we'll, let's just we. There's a few more hands raised. I'd like to if we if we want to just go through that and we can you know table those questions till um, till we're done. Um, Jane, you can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you all. Um, uh, so just a couple of comments. Um, I appreciate. Uh, your efforts to to help us understand what's covered by the current edition and what okay. will I just I just want to jump in Jane can you identify yourself <laughs> Oh I'm sorry yes Jane That's Wald okay. yes Jane Wald um uh resident of Amherst and uh, preservation practitioner for a little while um so yeah so just wanted to uh thank you for clarifying what's covered by the current edition and what will be revealed when that edition comes off. Um, I appreciate the identification of modifications uh, to the North facade with the, when the 1990s edition was put on. Um, and the care for the potential for damage to the historic structure during the process of demolition. Um, so I know this is public comment and, and not a question answer, but um, I guess the one thing I'm not really clear on is um, about the plaster and gypsum covered walls and what their condition is and, you know, whether there is potential for restoration or whether the 1990s work uh, has, has somehow obscured or made it not restorable. So um, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. All right, Jenny, you can unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Ginny Hamilton. Um, I live on Middle Street in Amherst currently. And um, while I am directly involved um, supporting the capital campaign, my comments tonight are my own as a resident of Amherst. Um, I, I echo Jane's um, appreciation of the care taken in this. Um, and, you know, with, with um, 40 years hindsight, I wish, or 30 years hindsight, I wish such care had perhaps been taken in, um, in the 1990s. Um, I appreciate that what is being taken away is the um, is the newest edition, and would like to point out that this this newest edition that is currently causing harm to our library. Um, so when we look at the loss, when we look at the flooding, when we look at the damage that's happening in our current climate, um, and caused in large part because of the leaking atrium, which has, is not repairable. Um, I'm grateful that we're looking at ways to remove these elements in order to protect the historic part, the truly historic part of our building. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, I don't see any more hands raised. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I would end our public uh, comment portion of uh, this combined hearing. And I think at this point we wanna move to discussion amongst the commissioners regarding the demolition. Um, I wanted to- uh, Robin, just... yep. I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Would it be appropriate for me to just say one thing at this point? Uh, I don't, I, that would be a question for Nate. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, okay, go ahead, yep. So um, I'm incredibly grateful for the comments made by uh, Sarah McKee and Jeff Lee and Hilda. They're wonderful citizens of, um, of Amherst and I, I respect them enormously. I just wanna be, uh, just state something as a matter of fact, so you all will know. Uh, we have been in touch repeatedly with the Mass Historic Commission to ask when it would be appropriate for us to come forward. And as far as we have been informed, we are fully in compliance with their requirements. Uh, we contacted them when we were in uh, really a stage of schematic design. We contacted them at design development, and we were told the same thing, which is it's too early for you to come to us. Sarah McKee, my former colleague and friend, is a um, is appropriately has been appropriately vigilant about this issue and has written many times to the Historic Commission as well as to the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Uh, they're fully apprised of her concern. And again, I just want to say, just as a matter of fact, we have been in regular touch with the Massachusetts Historic Commission and have been told by staff members that we are doing exactly what we should be um, doing. Thank you. Yeah, I actually was going to um, reiterate that as well. Um, when Jane Wald was our chair previously, um, she also made uh, similar comments that there is a point in the construction process um, that is later down the line that MHC wants to see um, plans as close to um, complete as possible because they are, um, it, it takes a lot of time to review and it doesn't suit anyone's purposes to have uh, one review that changes and then needs to be um, submitted again. I myself worked uh, with City of Greenfield in their housing re rehab project, and we did not um, submit the project notification form. You sometimes hear to it refer to it as the PNF for our housing rehabilitation projects until we had a final scope of work. And um, so uh, as early as possible, sounds like um, it should have been a long time ago, but it really means uh, as early as possible uh, at, and at the appropriate time. A PNF submitted um, six years ago would, um, would probably be pretty much useless at this point and would have to be entirely revised. So um, that's a, a bit of technical stuff for our commissioners to and members of the public to take in. But um, I think that we have a pretty um, consistent uh, opinion on that with uh, most of the people who are involved in this project. And um, uh, I'm just wanted to reiterate that. Did you have any comment on that, Nate? No, I, I think earlier uh, tonight, we had mentioned that if there's other reviews related to, you know, whether it's the product notification form or tax credits or any other um, program or process, we would, you know, the commission would meet again. So I'm, you know, tonight we're focusing on the demolition and then, you know, if we move on to, um, to it, the preservation restriction review. So I think there's, you know, overlapping um, jurisdictions here and it may be that the commission meets a few times to discuss this project for different purposes, but. Uh, and actually, I, I'm, I have a note here. I realized that this just procedurally, um, it raised kind of a question or, or potential clarification. So we're here, you know, normally when the commission meets with somebody, like you said, with the demolition request before us, they're looking to demolish an entire structure and they're looking to do it pretty quickly. Um, this demolition, I assume, is going not going to be a separate part of this project. It's gonna be a part of the project so that the demolition itself would fall under the PNF and would be reviewed by MHC. 
So we would be giving permission from the commission, but then MHC would still be looking at that. Is that is that a correct assessment, Nate? Yeah, I think they'd be both looking at the demolition and then also the um, new addition. Right. So that's, right. That's so. Fair. So it would be it would we would be giving permission, but it's still going to have those eyes looking at it because it's going to be part of this whole project that's going to be need to be reviewed by other the other appropriate authorities. Right. So our demolition review is by you know per our local regulation, right? It's not it's because we have a demolition you know bylaw uh, in Amherst, and so that's why that's the review we're we're having tonight, um, right? According to our local bylaw, yes. Um, so do any commissioners want to add um, comment or discussion at this point, or um, if there is no comment or discussion, put forth a motion. Okay, I'm going to be like the teacher and start calling on you. <laughs> Um, just just to make things easier. Hattie, do you have any uh, any further comment or discussion at this point? Oh, you're, you're muted. muted. Do you mean related to the demolition delay? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the request for demolition permit. Yes, I have um, one question, which is about um, what provisions have been made for the dem demolished material. Um, in the town of Amherst, we pride ourselves on our um, climate awareness. Um, I'm just aware that there's a lot of embodied carbon in the 1993 editions building, and I want to know a little bit more about that. Maybe right now isn't appropriate, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Um. Yeah, if the um, architecture team has any information on whether the, any materials would be reused or anything pertinent. We'll, uh, it's, uh, I can't say a lot of it will be reused, but it will be recycled. Okay. Um, that it is a good question that Hetty asked. And I, I think the presentation has helped us to understand exactly what part of the building the demolition is going to be in, involved in the demolition. And I, I don't have more questions about that. Thanks, Pat. Antonia, do you have any questions or discussion? Um, Not at this moment. Um, I think it's been quite clear. Thank okay. you. Michaela? I don't have any questions either. <laughs> um, so at that point, um, the question is, do we have someone who uh, would like to make a motion? Um, a motion could be to uh, permit uh, the issuance of a demolition permit for the 1992-1993 structure. It could also, also be a motion to impose a demolition delay. I propose a motion that we consider the demolition. Okay, so um, Pat has uh, put forth a motion that we uh, issue a demolition permit for the demolition of the 1992-93 structure. Is that correct, Pat? Putting words in your mouth? No, that, that that's exactly correct. Thank you. Okay, I will second that motion. I was going to jump in and just throw okay. uh, in conditions uh, that... Yep. We're discussed tonight and but just so we'd have them one would be for the protection of the existing building and then the the um um you know the removal and and reuse of the fan light you know the whipple window okay. so i guess and, those and and i think also the palladium window as as presented that the, the, the palladium the, window is actually not a part of the demolition it's a part of the existing historic structure so, so it's the we, preservation part that we're talking about that oh sorry about that that's okay i know it's very confusing so we're just <laughs> we'll talk about the palladium <laughs> window later <laughs> those are okay that that's uh so um pat's uh motion amended with nate's suggestions to include conditions for the careful preservation of the existing structure during demolition 
and the careful removal, storage, and reuse of the Whipple window. And I second that motion. Um, and so if there is no further discussion, which I don't think that there is, we can go forward with a roll call vote. Uh, does everybody under, we have two new commissioners. Does everybody understand what we are voting on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see Michaela nodding. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Pat. I vote in the affirmative. Okay. Um, Antonia. Um, I vote affirmative. Okay. Uh, Hetty. I'm abstaining. Okay. Michaela. I vote affirmative. And I vote affirmative as well. So I'm so used to. Uh, um, Unanimous votes. How many was that, Nate? <laughs> We're uh, one please. abstain. Right. Four zero one would be the vote. Okay, four zero one. Uh, so the motion passes, and the demolition uh, permit will be extended. And um, Nate, I'm assuming you will be in touch with uh, everyone who is uh, needs to be informed. <laughs> right. Okay. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so I think at this point I close the demolition hearing Nate, and then um, it's 8.08, we can talk about um, what we'd like to do with the remainder of our time and um, uh, dealing with the preservation restriction. So um, if that's the case, then the um, hearing for demolition is closed at 8.08 PM on the 14th of September. Sure, it works for me. I think the, um, I'll just say quickly the, you know, so the next, the, what, the hearing that has, you know, been opened is the review according to the preservation restriction. And it requires that uh, changes be reviewed um, in terms of the national park standards. Um, you know, the, um, there's different categories here. It's uh, rehabilitation. So it's a rehabilitation project and there's standards set forth um, that the commission will be using uh, additionally, the restriction lists as an exhibit. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but what things that are considered major or minor alterations to the site and building that would be reviewed. And so as part of that exhibit, it lists, you know, removal of mature trees or landscape features uh, would need to be reviewed by the commission, um, as would any demolition or a, uh, addition and change in materials or design. And so uh, you know, the restriction doesn't prevent changes. It, it just requires that it go through a review process. And so, um, you know, part of what the reason why the hearings were open together is that we, we've heard a little bit about what's happening with the new addition and what's happening um, uh, to the building. The preservation restriction is really, again, only concerned with the exterior of the 2728 building. So, you know, all those interior changes are things that, um, you know, if, if they're, um, you know, if they are visible or if they somehow relate to the structure of the building, then they're they're particularly relevant. But otherwise, uh, some of those other changes um, would be part of a discussion at another meeting, a later meeting. And so, um, I, I don't know if that's a good enough intro. And if we want, um, Robin, if you have anything else to add. You're muted. Um, yeah, no, I don't have anything to add at this point, I think, um, I mean, and then I'll add something up. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of items here and um, in it, I had a good meeting with Nate before just figuring out how to structure this meeting to focus on the demolition first. And now we have to consider the preservation restriction, um, our capacity to approve uh, changes to the exterior and then um, advisory um, comment on changes to the interior. But um, without a, a list in front of us of items to go through item by item, I'm, I'm just concerned about how to quite how to direct that discussion at this point. Um, Nate, I don't know if you want to weigh in on. Yeah, I mean, I think is there, if, if, you know, if the library, if there's a presentation you'd want to walk through, um, you know, we had thought if we started with the site, um, you know, the gardens have already been reviewed, but if we want to do site, demolition first and then we could stick with the um, um 27 building you know the original building 27 28 and then the addition and how you know that's compatible so 
we could compartmentalize the review in terms of those three pieces. And so, you know, really, if, you know, what, you know, for instance, um, there's a request to have new roofing material in the library. And, you know, there's a few, maybe a few other changes to the original building. And so those would be taken separately from the addition. And when we look at the addition right now, it's really about the massing scale, you know, fenestration patterns, uh, voids, um, those things would be looked at. Um, we talk about the addition. So I don't know if that makes sense for everyone. And we could start with the, the landscape in site. I think that makes sense. And I think we actually, I believe, uh, structured our presentation to do just that. Great. So I think um, that's good. I'll go ahead sorry, and share my sorry. screen. Oh, that's okay. Um, and I just wanted to ask Nate what, um, just to have a, since it's 812 now, what we want to think about as an end time for this particular meeting. and possibly having a, well, I think most likely having a continuation going forward. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's for the commission members and everyone, um, you know, we have 16 attendees right now. So uh, a few have, um, well, are now panelists, but, you know, a few, you know, there's a few that may not stay too much later. This is being recorded, so it'll be available on Zoom. You can always watch it after. Um, it'll be posted online tomorrow. Um, yeah, I mean, our, you know, sometimes we could, we could even take a break in a few minutes right now before the presentation, or if we're ready, we could say we let's go till nine or nine fifteen, and then we'll we'll continue it to a date certain. I mean, we could give ourselves an hour more. I mean, I, that's kind of up to the commission and everyone here and the, the panelists. Okay, um, from the commission members, um, what is your availability? Does nine fifteen work for everyone, or actually just go ahead and unmute yourself if if it doesn't work for you. I'm going to assume that I didn't hear anybody, so everybody can go to 915. So let's um, do that. Um, do we want to take a break? That seems like if we're going to go to 915, that would be a good idea to maybe take a five minute break. Oh, and um, in terms of the presenters too, does that time work for you as well? It, it does. Thank you very much for asking. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So why don't we take a break and Right, so it's 8, 13, it's 8 13. We could just say like a few minute break. We'll be we'll be back, you know, in three, three, four minutes. Okay. Sounds right. good. Thanks. Okay, great.
This is a nice group. We don't often get a break. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, I just had a quick uh, dinner. <laughs> yeah, I need a refill. Thank you. Nate, what's the image behind your background? Yeah, it's Town Hall uh, back in the day. How oh, nice. Yeah, I figure it's appropriate for the Historical Commission. It is, yeah. <laughs> I change it for every meeting. No, no. Mm. <laughs> Very nice. All right, it's probably, it's been, a, it's been quite a bit of time. I think we could probably jump back. I don't see Austin. Or maybe they're here, just not visible. Can we get Jim, started? Or yeah. do you want to wait? There's Jim. I guess we could pull up the presentation, Justin. Yeah, why don't we just do that? Okay, so I think we'll just get started, and um, I think we're going to pretty much follow your your script, Nate. So I think we're going to just have an overview of the site and then talk about the building. So, um, so this is this is a view, an aerial view, kind of showing all the adjacent buildings and streets adjacent to the library, just to orient us which you guys have seen earlier today. Um, we've got the North Prospect parking lot where CVS is on the north side, the Strong House and History Museum to the northwest, Amity Street to the south, and then the Works, the Drake, and the Fire Station on the east side. Next slide. Here's some images of what the exterior site looks like today. Um, so a view of the front of the library from Amity Street, from the parking lot across the street where a lot of public park and walk in, the raised crosswalk, the public sidewalk, the tent structure that it has um, developed around the time of the COVID pandemic and, and sometimes is up. And that, that main entry, which it has a step up so it is not currently accessible. Uh, a view of that side entry that is accessible with the ramp and the railing. Um, we will be taking down that railing and we'll be reconfiguring this side access so that it is a smoother transition into the library. Um, some views of the of the um, of the Norway spruce for the Historical Society property. We did walk the site with Alan Snow, the tree warden in town, and talked at length about how to protect both the Historical Society's Norway spruce and the Historical Society's sycamore heritage tree during construction. So that, that's something that we're really, really, we really care a lot about. Um, and then some views of the back, the back uh, landscape, which again, um, we believe is part of the 1990s edition regrading and landscaping. So the, the plant material is being relocated to the South Amherst location. And then in the far right corner is that north entry today. Um, it's really hard to see from the CVS parking lot and, and you know, with all the bushes and the terrain and the grade. Um, but that back wall um, touches the existing property line that will be maintaining that property line boundary in their project. Next slide. In the process, um, we looked at some old historic uh, postcards of the library from the 1930s through 50s, and it kind of gave us a clue of what the original landscape might have been out front. Um, it's interesting that there was head-in parking on Amity Street, um, not parallel parking, and then parallel parking uh, alongside the building where we now have angled parking. Um, there were some 
full mounted light poles and some minimal landscaping um, out front, which does not remain today. Next slide. So these are some landscape sections elevations. Um, so the first, the top view is looking kind of cut, cutting cutting the ground plane and looking at the building, um, showing you how how gentle those new sidewalks are that we're proposing um, and how they connect down to the parking lot for that accessible entrance. Um, there will be uh, two new Goshen, walls, Goshen stone walls to uh, flank the main entry plaza. Um, that you would pass through to get into the main door. Then on the north edition, again, um, we have a very level reading patio terrace um, off of that new addition. And then in that northwest property line boundary, we are, um, we're softening the wall and, and introducing a, a terrace wall that could be seating. Next slide. On the west side, so the side that faces North Prospect Street, um, we're going to remove a lot of the vegetation along that side um, for maintenance and for visibility. And then again, that um, exit door off of the west side of the library, children's area, emergency egress. Um, we have a fully accessible walkway out to Amity Street. The children's area, you can see, is screened from the street um, with, with the Cunningham White's rhododendron. On the east side, we're looking at um, a section through the street, the Amity Street sidewalk, the parking area, and then um, and then going down to where the dumpster enclosure is and the accessible walk all the way to the back. Next slide. In terms of materials, as we think about um, structures in the landscape, we're trying to keep in character with with downtown and with the um, 1920s, 28, 27 building. Um, any of the fencing or railings on the top of um, on the top of a wall or the railing, the railing enclosure around the children's area is more like the ornamental fence in the top middle of the screen. The dumpster enclosure is um, like what you see here in the upper right hand corner. It'll screen, they'll have a gate and be fully enclosed. And then we do have a set of four steps uh, along the front. Um, we imagine that some people might be taking a shortcut through. Um, and so these are the type of railings that would be used. Um, they, they are, we have used them effectively at Amherst College and other, other places um, and have gotten the accessibility board to agree that these are acceptable. In the children's um, patio area, we're looking at using stamped concrete um, and I've identified 12 birds of Amherst that we will stamp their, their feet, feather, and outline patterns in the concrete for kids to color in or to walk through on paths. And then um, in the back in the rain garden, we have a metal grate uh, walkway with railings, um, curb railings that meet ADA requirements along the side. Next slide. In the front, um, we will be repurposing the Goshen Stone on site and incorporating it into uh, Goshen Stone's um, benches and site walls. Um, and then in the back, we'll have more contemporary um, working tables and seating tables for of different heights for kids, folks in wheelchairs, and, and people who may want to stand. Uh, we also have um, bike racks both at the front and at the back. Um, that are really simple, simple and clean lines. Next slide. The view in the upper left-hand corner is a plan from above, looking at that north entry to the library. Um, on the left-hand side, the yellow line is the is a new retaining wall that we are placing along the historical society property. Kind of tying into that same footprint where the existing wall is, but extending a little bit more for access access to the west. Um, in that zone between the retaining wall and the library um, new library addition wall, we've actually um, created a, a really cool gathering space with catenary lighting, 
crushed stone paving and removable chairs. Uh, and we're proposing um, flowering vines along the wall too for a little bit of seasonal green and interest. Next slide. As part of this process, we did do, we did take a, a really deep look at what hardscape materials are on site and what, how we could reuse them in the landscape. Um, so there are quite a bit of Goshen stone pavers of different sizes, granite pavers at the front entry and granite benches. The granite pavers, we have actually, we're planning for uh, repurposing them um, and placing them as, as horizontal bands within our concrete walks. Um, the granite bench, we're hoping to reuse in, in the rain garden area, either as a bench or part of those bridges. And then the Goshen stone can be repurposed as the Goshen stone benches that we have both at the front and then at the back. Next slide. And these are these are just more of the materials on site. The the back stone wall um, that borders the CVS parking lot will not be necessary with our new grading. Um, but the, those stones can be repurposed again in, in those features I mentioned. Um, and, and that stone wall, the stone wall in the middle right will be will be removed to make make room for a bigger space um, adjacent to the new addition. Next slide. And a, this is a summary of, of those materials and square footage that we've calculated for use, use on the project. Next slide. As we thought about the landscape, both at the front and the back, um, we were trying to think about what color palettes and textures might be appropriate. For the front, we're keeping a really uh, minimal color palette uh, with evergreens, soft green textures, and a couple accents of purples and whites. Um, we did go through a series of um, studies of different trees to plant out front and settled on um, a beautiful yellow magnolia. We'll be have two of those flanking the front, um, and and then um, can plant bulbs and and within the beds adjacent to the the rhododendrons. Next slide. At the back, on uh, the north side of the property, adjacent to the CVS lot, that will be functioning as a as a stormwater garden. Um, in time, that will be very shaded um, and and more more damp. So it's an opportunity for mosses and ferns and sedges with some accents of perennials. Again, keeping sight lights sight lines open, allowing stormwater, and also kind of creating a garden feel. Next slide. So up front, we'll retain the two existing Chinese dogwoods that are on the corner of the southwest and southeast corner of the building. Um, and then we'll uh, remove the lilac and the rose bushes that are underneath those. Um, they are, they are um, intensive to maintain the existing plantings there. Um, and what we are proposing does not require trimming um, and, and would be easier to maintain. So we'll have the, the evergreen rhododendrons underneath those kind of creating two, two outdoor rooms on the southwest and southeast side of the library, one for the children's area and one for an uh, informal gathering underneath a sourwood tree. Um, great to read a book in, in the shade. And then um, the two areas where the buttercup magnolia are proposed out front kind of flanking the front of the building, but again, not not blocking views of the building from the street and providing a little bit of shade. And then we were proposing oak leaf hydrangea um, between the parking lot and, and the rest of the library to kind of screen the parking, but still have sight lines over. We did get some feedback from the design review board that a portion of this might want to be a lower plant material. So we we're looking at substituting that with um, another, another plant that maxes out around 18 inches on the lower part of that. Next slide.
in the back because we are having to remove um, three shade trees, um, but we are protecting an existing maple tree by the old shed. Um, we will be planting other shade trees that do really well in, in the wetter soil conditions because this area is receiving um, stormwater from both the library and from the Historical Society property. Um, so the swamp white oak is something that really can handle wet feet, as can the sassafras and the willow oak. Um, but also these are trees that are adapted to climate change. So they can, you know, as our as our climate warms, these these are trees that will that will be able to continue to provide shade and habitat um, and benefit to pollinators. In addition, we have, um, we're proposing a fringe tree on the north, again, to kind of help a little bit with softening that canopy and providing, providing some seasonal interest. And then on the ground plane, we're using um, a mix of mosses, ferns, and sedges and bulb and bulbs. Next slide. Site lighting, um, we heard from the design review board, there's a, a real need to make sure that north side is well lit. And so we've been working with a lighting designer to um, work through the foot candles, make sure those are evenly dispersed upon the site sidewalks. Um, so that's something that's gonna come be presented in our um, site plan package. The light fixtures themselves, again, kind of keeping with the aesthetic of downtown Amherst, we're looking at pole mounted sight lights within the walking paths at the back that um, that are 10 feet high, so they they feel much more personal in the in the back. They are full cut off, so they do not emit light above of the horizon above the top of the fixture to help minimize light pollution. And in the parking lot, we have an arm mounted fixture that mimics the light fixture that's out front of the library. Um, and the same shape of fixture and, and arm. And that's a little bit higher on a 12, 12 foot height. Next slide. I think Tony will talk us through the site lighting on the building. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, the intent here is to create a lighting that is appropriate, both in character and lighting quality uh, with respect to exterior building lighting and the picture images that you just see in the lower right um, underneath the, the chart just represents the type of lighting fixtures that we are proposing, most of which are discrete and uh, understated. So I think we'll now move into the changes to the 1927-28 building. Uh, so again, uh, what we see here, this is the existing south uh, front elevation. Um, the area in pink um, are to be demolished. And I will point out there's one small area that I think, Justin, you want to circle. That is where the proposed book drop off is being located um, to the right of the existing entryway. And then here we can see the proposed south elevation. Um, what this uh, demonstrates again is that the New addition is largely hidden, and its its massing is, uh, we believe, appropriately scaled and lower than the historic main portion of the library itself. As we took towards the uh, existing east elevation, here we see again where the proposed areas are being removed in 1990s addition, and then at the front of the east elevation, there are selective areas where we are going to be removing the ramp that exists on the left, the Josephine's outlining, along with the steps. And then to the far right, um, there are some existing openings that are going to be modified and adjusted. <clears throat> and here again, you can see the proposed uh, addition uh, to the right of the existing building. And then the lighter shade of pink is where the new addition uh, is really behind the historic 1927, 1928 wing, and then you can see to the elevational changes at entrance to the um, side area that Rachel's it enabled us to create a slope walkway that eliminates the need for handrails, and we are adding just a handrail uh, balustrade condition there to just make sure people don't fall off uh, the edge there. On uh, the existing north elevation, uh, this again uh, shows where the 1990s portion in pink is being removed. 
and then the proposed new addition, uh, which comes forward of the existing uh, 1927 building. And as we described before, um, this is in proud of it, but the historic fabric of the 1927 edition uh, essentially becomes indoor uh, space and the, and the materiality and the expression of it is preserved or restored uh, to a great extent. And this, this shows what we are proposing. And then on the west elevation, again, the area in pink highlights what is being proposed to be demolished from the 1990s portion. <clears throat> and then the proposed new west elevation, as you can see again, shown in pink um, in this particular view. The other aspects that we are uh, proposing is of impacting the window uh, head and jam details in respect to the glazing um, because um, the existing uh, glazing is single pane. Um, in order to meet energy and current codes as well as improve efficiency, we are proposing to put new windows uh, that are going to be insulated glazing units, but we're going to create the sash elements of the windows to essentially match the existing finish and style to retain the historic appearance and to ensure that the change um, minimizes the visual impact while increasing the energy efficiency as a result of placing a contemporary um, window system in place of the existing. Here you can see that we were asked to identify particular areas that are being proposed and changed. So starting with number one, the lower right is the existing image, the upper left is the rendering. Uh, we are going to propose a new synthetic slate roof uh, on the existing building. Um, the areas that are identified as such. In number two, we are going to create these new windows that I just described, but are going to match the existing profile and subdivided light uh, appearance. We are going to repoint the uh, stone, at least up to 50% of it um, where needed. There will be new gutters and downspouts that will be uh, installed, but to match those that exist. And we will provide new paint at approximately 10% of the painted surfaces that exist on the historic building. Next. And as we turn to this uh, other view, um, again, the lower image on the right is existing and proposed rendering is upper left. So again, this should, again points out where we're proposing the new uh, synthetic slate roof uh, on the existing. The new windows, number two, to match those existing with replacing glazing. Again, number three is repointing the 50% of the masonry. And number four, again, is the new gutters and downspouts to match those existing. And again, number five is to new paint at 10% of the painted surfaces as indicated. I think it's a typo, it's 100%. Sorry, not 100%. It may be 10% of what's the total area is paintable. Uh, and then the synthetic slate here, we can see the materials of the roof. So this is the proposed synthetic slate um, uh, shown in the lower left. And then the lower right is an example that uh, such a synthetic slate was used on, a, on another project. On the proposed addition. Uh, sorry, I just before we go, I just um, just because we've covered the site and the building. Yeah, we can stop there. Yeah, just um, yeah, maybe I don't or I, I, well before we go, maybe we'd ask Robin and the commission what they want to do. If you want to talk, you know, stop and talk about this. It's um eight forty four. Do you want to go through the rest of it, um, and then. I mean, I'm thinking, given the time, maybe we just talk about the two. Uh, sections that were presented. It would be fine with me. Does anybody have any objection? Hearing no objection, then um, yeah, we can stop there and discuss what's been presented so far. Right. Um, I had some questions. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with landscape uh, as much as I am with having recently completed a preservation degree, um, questions about the Secretary of the Interior Standards and um, not retaining the original windows or replacing uh, the replacement of the slate roof with a synthetic. Um, and then I just had sort of a technical question about repointing, which I'm pretty sure you're familiar with. But um, since the CPA is 
funding part of the project and we have to align with the secretary standards i'm you know i'm familiar with them from an academic perspective but not from um you know a professional practice but my understanding would be that it would be unusual to replace uh, an operational existing historic window with with a um with a replication and similarly um the slate roof. I'm just curious um, what your, I am, and I'm sure your firm has a lot of experience with this. Um, how how those things get um, get justified when dealing with the secretary standards? Jim, do you want to answer this particular query with respect to that? Jump in. Yes, I think on the windows, um, the question is, you know, <laughs> is is operable versus what's there in the condition. So what we determined at this point is that the condition of the windows is such that they could be justified as for being replaced in kind. Also, okay. I think storm windows on the building, which, you know, do some sort of done what detract from the, the character of the original building. So we would be able to still be efficient and remove the storm windows with a new window. So we'd like to follow that approach. Now, at some point, you know, we do have to demonstrate that. Uh, and uh, I think we I think we feel confident we can do that. Um, otherwise, it's a repair and fix up job. And, and with the single glazing, you know, you're just the energy issues are just not met uh, with that. So. So I think, yeah. So just quickly staying with the windows, it looks like it's true divided light right now. Yes. And so the question is, would it, would there still be exterior uh, grills? And then are, is the amount of glazing, you know, the, the actual width of the window, the sash for be, staying the same. So it's not, you know, sometimes yeah. replacement windows actually have a smaller glazing percentage, right? There's a, it's a smaller. The concept is to really match the existing size of the muntins so that the glass size would be, I believe, pretty much exactly what's there now. Mm -hmm. And the muntins, the muntins will match in profile. We've had pretty good luck now these days with people remaking, you know, wood windows of quality. Um, right. We've used several companies and, and uh, had, had good good luck with that. So, so the idea is that the window sash will all be replaced and it should match in profile uh, in dimension the existing. And the slate roof. Slate roof. We've also run into this, and I know the the uh, standards do allow that in cases of, you know, well, it is a, it's it's a very expensive operation. Uh, the question, I think, the slate roof. I think our investigation shown that you know it's it's not in great shape. There was a lot of repair work done when the addition was built, um, but it it really is getting near the end of its life. So it seems like the time to replace the roof. For the first part, using the substitute material really has become sort of a, as a, you know, it's an economic issue to a degree. We have done this on several certified uh, historic restoration projects, even at the federal level. So it's a question that uh, we would like to propose it as something here as well. Okay. And just to jump in quickly, with the roof right now, there is... um. Looks like copper flashing, maybe you know, um, at different mm -hmm. break points, like above the uh, dormered windows and in the roof. So, are you proposing what? What are you proposing then for, like, say, the flashing and like drip edge detail? All copper. Uh, it would be copper. copper. Yeah. yeah. All Those, copper. The valleys and the caps and things. Yes, so it would be copper and and the gutter. All right, yeah, and the down spots. Yeah. All right, and the chimney caps that are there, they're all remaining, right? So nothing's being removed from the chimneys, is that? Nothing's being removed, no. Right, yeah. All right. So I, I have a question, if I may, um, going back to the windows. Am I understanding that they will replicate, but be energy efficient to what exists now? Yes, because they'll be double glazed. The glazing is just single, you know, right now. So they will match, but they'll have two two panes of glass with an airspace. But they will they will effectively look like what the original windows are. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and I think you answered my question about the roof in that it would need repair and replacement, which 
could be prohibitive cost wise if it were slate. That, that's yes. Unfortunately, with the budget limits we've got, yes, it, it's going to be. It would be prohibitive. Can any part of the slate roof be be preserved, like the facing Amity Street? Uh, you know this. Well, I think we really would. Ha we'd have to investigate. Then it's no. We have done that. Sorry, Jim. It is beyond its life. That's the trouble. Okay. Yeah. One, of, one of the things that we're going to try to do is the portion of the um, historic building that will now be inside of our new addition. We're trying to reuse that existing slate because it's not it's not keeping out the weather anymore. So what you'd be we're trying to do this. What you're when you're in the library and you can see the existing um, the historic wall in portion of the roof. We're going to try to keep that slate intact. But the slate on the on the Amity Street in all that all the slate that will be exposed has it's at the end of its life. Okay, thank you. And so, just quickly, the gutters. Are you still going to do like the half round, um, same profile that are is, is there now, or is it? Yeah, that's the intention. Yes. And then, um, you know, I know earlier versions of synthetic slate had problems with like cupping and warping. Um, you know, I, I don't know how, you know, if the, what you're proposing to use, if that's an issue. You know, we, it's, it, the product has improved a lot because we did use some very early on and we had some issues too. Um, I think, you know, we just need to drive it home with the, the manufacturer and look, make sure we get the right warranty on the roof. But the the record lately, as I understand it, has been quite good for the, the maintenance and the, the longevity. Nate, did you have some questions about um, the profile of the, is it the HVAC equipment that's on the roof or? That'd be probably with the addition, not the existing. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. and um. And I'll make you know doors and everything. I mean that. I just want to make sure you know again that we're not missing anything. But the existing doors, entryways. You know, at one point in one of the plans, it was proposed to have some type of trellis over the main front door, but that's not the case anymore. I, at one point, there was like some plexiglass idea of like plexiglass, right? Atrium or something. Is that? Yeah. No, that we we are not doing that. But all so the the existing doors were remain or are they going to be replaced with something that looks similar or the same ellen do we have an issue with the main entry door no no great no the what, doors yeah the doors we're we're keeping um they're they're in good shape they need to be refurbished so um it'll be refurbished it'll be new hardware um we know the that front door it's really kind of a masterpiece so That'll remain and get restored so it's back to its original condition. And especially that wonderful broken pediment in the yeah. front. <laughs> don't find those often. All right. And then, and for the site, um, thanks, Rachel. So you're keeping, um, you know, just because the restriction requires, you know, mature landscaping or things to be reviewed. And sometimes it's like, you know, uh, I see it as, you know, what kind of landscaping was it? Was it original to the building? What was the purpose of what's there? And so, you know, almost everything that's there now has been added to after the fact. And so it sounds like really you're keeping the dogwoods uh, and then proposing all new plantings along the front, um, you know, kind of a low, low evergreens to, you know, act as a, you know, like a fence or enclosure for some outside space, but really it's not going to detract from the view of the building. Is that Correct. And it actually is going to increase visibility of the building where right now the lilacs are kind of taking over um, and, and blocking the view. So you, you're going to have a really beautiful view of that that stone facade and all the windows um, from Amity Street. One of the things we were always curious about is we never found a formal landscape plan from the original drawings. There were some photo, you know, early photographs, but there was never a apparently a formal landscape plan, so.
Right. And then I think there's a there's a sign or there was a sign in uh, bike racks out front. There's a sign that actually said the Jones Library. Is that is that I don't know if that's even there anymore. There's a wooden sign. Is that yeah? I believe the project is removing the sign. Um, but the signage for the project as a whole will be coming coming back um, for review as a separate review. Okay. Do commissioners have any questions or comments? It's really great to see um, this presentation again. I had listened in on the design review board and I really am happy with the uh, <clears throat> landscape site plan. Um, I think it's it really shows how carefully you've studied the original building, even if you didn't have a landscape plan. Um, and I love the choice of the yellow magnolia. I think <clears throat> there's a beautiful one or two at the UMass campus, and it's really, really a stunning choice there. Um, I'm worried about the book drop, um, the visual nature of a book drop in a in a placement by that window. I, I on the tour we were it was explained to us how the whole automated book drop system will be working within that space. Um, but I just wonder about the sort of asymmetry, really. It's a, you know, suddenly we have to see this new book drop um, on a, an extremely beautiful facade. So I'm just curious about that. And um, <clears throat> on the West Elevation, um, I had an opportunity to look at a lot more historic photographs of the, the theatre inside the building and at some of the barrel vaulting that I think seems to me to be the sort of historic respect that you have carried through into the new edition, and I like that very much. I still <clears throat> um, have a question about the scale and massing of that west side and the north side it just uh feels <clears throat> um larger than it needs to be it may be that you had square footage considerations that you were needing to meet i see ellen nodding <laughs> head um you know i i, I i'm <laughs> i've worked in an architect's office and i know this is tricky um and i think I think the reason I'm going to keep banging on about it is just that 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 original building has a beautiful sense of a hierarchy of form from the 1928 time period. And I I don't see that in terms of the of the addition. I, it's not that I'm looking for an for a contrast because I know that you've created that. I'm looking for some sense of the continuation of that idea of massing to create the Connecticut River Valley house, large house for Amherst. And I'm looking to, to try and see that in the north and west facades that are part of the, the new addition. Did someone want to speak to that? Um, I mean, it's a good question. I think um, you know, I, I, again, a very preliminary understanding of of mm -hmm. um, the appropriate balance of an addition to a historic structure. And and looking at it from the front, you can see that you know you really do to retain that whole sense of the original building, and then the um, north facade has, you know, is um, obviously the biggest change, but also you, you don't, the, the, the historic part of the building isn't drawn into it. So it's sort of like, you know, it's kind of more acceptable that it's a new, new side. But I think for a lot of us here, I mean, Hetty has a really strong background, but um, a lot of us here aren't as familiar with 
you know, how you professionally go about designing something like this, especially given uh, space requirements and that sort of thing. I'll talk a little bit about the program, but Tony will, will pick up on the design. But Hedy, you're right. The building is the size it is because of the program, right? You hit the nail on the head. Um, and if you look at our site, it is, you know, if you're looking at from Amity Street, we have the big cutout in the back. So we are really limited on what we could do um, with this. So it is, it is, um, I forget the exact square footage of the additions, but it, but it's big, but it's, it's the, the program is what is required for, a, a, you know, a, a current day in hopefully future library um, to accommodate all the needs of the library. So that's the program. So that was our challenge, but we did, the, and I'll let Tony pick it up, but we did try to keep that the original building as the the gem that it is, right? And we, we didn't want to compete with it. And so we, our addition is on the quieter side. So we're not competing. Yeah, I think the, um, and thanks, Helen. I think what we were also attempting to to do as much as possible is, and you can see it, I believe in this view, especially um, the addition here, we were trying to scale it as modestly as we could, um, given the, extent of program that we had to provide and accommodate for the library. And so the the form of it does have uh, sort of, a, now we say contemporary reinterpretation of the gambrel ends of the existing historic library. And it is purposely kept lower in massing, especially relating to the main historic front. So it would not tend to dominate, but sort of recede and background it. Um, and I think the other thing that we were sensitive to is in the nature of the materiality of it. We're trying to keep uh, the materials very simple and very quiet. Um, I think the beautiful nature, Hedy, as you pointed out about this historic building, it, it, is a, it is a beautiful building. And part of the quality of that is the nature of the materials, in particular the stone and other elements. So uh, in order to not compete with that, um, we are purposely keeping the nature of the brick uh, on very quiet and very understated and sort of very muted. We really want it to be a backdrop um, to the historic um, portion of the of the main library itself. And so that was uh, the attempt to really mass it. I think the other thing I will point out in the nature of the library itself, um, part of the way that we evolved the windows and the dormers that you see here, uh, it was also very important to try to bring as much natural light as we can into the library. It, it is a fairly deep plan. There's a lot of um, spaces that are being programmed in this library. Uh, and is on several levels. And in order to fulfill, in particular, the nature of the program spaces and the way the patrons and the community would use a library, um, we know the importance of natural daylight. And so trying to enhance lighting for um, bringing in the outside, plus the views from the library to the outside, I think are equally important. So I think we were queuing in off of, you know, features and elements of the nature of breaking down dormers and scaling them is like that in order to accomplish um, uh, ability to bring light in, but but in a more contemporary way um, uh, that wasn't trying to mimicry, but complement. So these are some of the guiding principles that we looked at uh, carefully. And we, and we did look at a lot of different ideas relating to massing and scale. And we felt trying to it, it, attempt to break the scale down was really the key and trying to be a background building was the other key. Thank you very much. Yeah, can you speak to the north facade a little bit? Sure. And we can go to the next few. <clears throat> I think it's one one rendering back. I'm not sure. It's from the back side. <clears throat> yeah. Well, again, while we're on this view. Yeah, yeah, okay, so we don't have, but we're on this view. The other thing I think that we're still pointing out here is that the nature of the addition, um, you can see is really um, uh, deferred. It's way back in the in the right-hand corner. Um, you almost, you hardly see it. Um, so again, trying to preserve the main historic library. The, the, the feeling of the library, particularly on the L-shaped plan of the historic 1927 part, um, and trying to preserve all the, you know, wonderful characteristics of it. I think that was really paramount in the way we designed the addition. <laughs> So that everything here really tends to, again, scale back, defer in sort of background and backdrop it so that the main historic legibility of the library from the front, uh, particularly on the main street and Emmy street, this is what drove us in the way we designed it. 
um, and these are the things that we attempted to do. Um, I'm sorry, we don't, I guess we don't have the rear noise elevation. Um, I guess the only thing I can point to is in the design of that, um, we also took the idea and maybe maybe the elevation. We can go to the elevation. We can talk to that. Let's talk to that, Chelsea. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Yeah, actually, let's go back one more elevation. I think the one on the, um, what is it, on the east? Well, here. Okay, so this was the first one. Um, that's, that was the perspective view we just saw a minute ago. So here you can see the um, addition on the far right uh, is a nod towards the gambrel end. Um, and we're trying to keep the, you know, the spring point of the roof elements and other things to sort of really genuflect against the historic components so that we really try to scale down mass and I think by by allowing the gamble lens to occur um, and in this case the width of it is sort of matching the width to the component to the left on the historic building attempts to really feel like it's part of an assemblage in some ways it's breaking down the scale of this to really be part of that language so again this is the attempt to really manifest the massing to really relate and sort of also defer so these are the things that I think uh, were the guiding principles with respect to for example this east elevation that you see here if we go to the, I think let's go to the west elevation next, excuse me. Um, so here, um, I think what we're trying to take advantage of in several instances is that the uh, spring point um, for the roof element that, it, that, that extends off the brick wall. I think Justin, you just want to point that out. And we're trying to again, use the, the scale of this to really break it down so that when the new addition uh, roof form begins to fold back on itself and create those dormers, and we're trying to keep the wall massing intentionally low on the front face um, in order to, again, defer and try to scale back against the historic library. And you can see clearly that the roof element and the height of this uh, new addition um, is substantially lower than the main body of the front historic uh, library uh, that you can see that Josephine is showing the peak of that gambrel land. I think the other thing here you can you can see on the far left again that that extension of that gambrel end um, is a, simply a repeat of what I just showed you a minute ago on the east elevation on the far left. So the notion of breaking the scale down and and the massing of the addition, um, we try to take advantage of the fact that while it it is you know clearly adding um, uh, quite a bit more space by breaking the massing down to two forms like this with their sort of talking to one another and in a way um, speaking to each other. It's attempting to use the nature of the gambrel end as an inspiration, but to use that language to inform the design. So here again, you can see the idea is to really take that and to take these elements here to scale uh, the overarching um, approach. Uh, one thing I will say that because the site does drop, as Rachel pointed out, the landscape issue, we're able to keep the scale of this west elevation also fairly low uh, because it doesn't drop uh, substantially until we get to the far left as we head towards the north. So this is the other area which we are uh, attempted to be cognizant of. Uh, again, then the introduction of the dormers is a nod towards the dormers that exist, but in a more contemporary way to allow uh, daylight and views to come into the new addition. And I guess we can go to the last elevation, which is the um, north. Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, so here, um, this is, um, of course, where the library shows to the largest extent. And uh, because at this point, the site is dropping a full story from the front to the back, um, we do have a higher volume here as it relates to the overarching site. But one of the things I think we're trying to um, take advantage of, if we can, is that even here, the nature of the building is still broken down into several components, um, which allows us to scale back the the element on the far right again is uh you know it, it is a sort of reinterpretation of the gambrel roof forms to keep the scaling of this um, more modest uh the area to the left shows the element that is turned 90 degrees to it um and therefore flanks the two gambrel ends facing each other in the notch in the corner it's a glazed a curtain wall system the attempt is to really bring light lightness to the addition also to break down the scale as one comes to the north elevation and to not to admit natural daylight, particularly to the reading areas within the library, but to allow the sort of forms to read more distinctly and apart. It, this is, helps to achieve a scale break. Uh, and then 
on the on the portion on the left, which is the north elevation of this facade, um, that component there, which is um, I know it's just all flat elevations, but we attempted to create this sort of expressed element that sort of pulls forward a little bit again to break the scale of that facade down on the north to while also bringing daylight into key program spaces within the library itself. Um, so all those things we we were trying to really minimize as much as possible the massing, the height, the scale, the relationship and the materiality and the, the way that the buildings are attempting to sort of play complement, but also backdrop to the historic library itself. Thank you. I think one of the challenges is that um, to the, the flatness of the elevation and not seeing the rendering on the side. It, yeah. um, it strikes me as more modern, but now that you know you put it in context, I I kind of see what you're I see what you're saying, and and having a rendering of it would help visualize it more in connection with the rest of the building. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so I'm just going to bring us back. You know, we looked at the site and the current, um, you know, the existing original building, and you know, we're reaching our time limit. So I guess, you know, Hetty had asked about the book drop in the front, and I, I'd like to see, you know, either um, alternatives or an image of what that would actually look like, not just a drawing. So you know, I mean, I think the symmetry of the front is really uh, important to the design, and so you know, that does add something, especially if the, the entries um, going to be remain visible. And so, you know, for next time, it'd be great to have, you know, a little bit more information about that. Um, I think the retaining wall in the back, um, you know, it, it's a pretty big retaining wall along the historical society property with possibly a fence on top. And I'd love to see, um, you know, either images or renderings or something that explains that a little bit more. Um, so that that will be a a a, a visual feature. Um, you know, I think there are illustrative plans, site plans uh, in the packet. So I think we can look at those for next time. I think it helps explain the whole the landscape and site. Um, and then the one thing with the slate, I'd love to know more about that warranty, um, Jim, that you mentioned. And so, you know, are there projects where uh, that could be referenced that you know the life. Uh, you know, I don't know how, how, you know, is it five or 10 years where, you know, what's, what's kind of the history of a newer synthetic slate roof? Like what's, you know, what's the lead, you know, the maintenance free time, um, you know, is it, what, what is that expectation? <laughs> um, and then, you know, cause for next time we can focus on kind of this addition. And so for the addition, I'd like to see a roof plan. I think you're showing a little bit here, but I know there's going to be like uh, HVAC on the roof and i'd like to know more about what's happening up there in terms of screening of that and you know what's the visual impact of that so you know a roof plan or or perspectives or something i, I think you know robin said it that these elevations are flat and sometimes hard to interpret and so if there's any way to um to show that i mean so I, you know i'd even suggest if you had a, a 3d model or other images and you could you know even just fly around in it on the zoom meeting or you take screenshots of a model and it just becomes part of a presentation it doesn't have to be you know a scale drawing like this but it's just you know something that's illustrative and helps explain kind of the massing and form of the addition and anything that's changing up on the um on the roof i think that would be helpful i don't know you know if the commission i'm, I'm trying to help for next time given that it's already almost 9 15 and so i don't know if the commission members have other ideas but to me those are things that i think could help help move uh, the conversation along. Nate, I, I echo the list you just made, but I thank Hetty because I kept going back to that book drop and the 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 asymmetry that it creates with the with the historical perspective of the front of the building. I I I I, I hope that can be reconsidered. And I, I guess we'll look for an answer the next time. But, but Hetty, I agree with you that that just takes away from the beauty of the the Amity Street view. Any other comments before we adjourn for this particular session? We'll have to continue to a date certain. And oh, I guess I a question. <laughs> these plans. 
have some call outs. I don't know if we're on the packet. So, um, you know, if I, don't, if I was just trying to compare them on the, the PDF that I had. And so I just want to make sure, like, say, for instance, on the front dormers on the original building, there were some call outs on this on this presentation. And I just want to make sure that was happening on like the roof and the size of the dormer, the materials and everything will remain the same. Um, uh, you know, as to what's there. So it'll match existing. Um, I might add a comment about the, the book chop, the view from the street. It's something that um, we can come back to you to talk about next time. But those Goshen Stone site walls that are proposed um, will screen a majority of that view. They come up almost to the height of the bottom of the windowsill of existing window. So that is a that will be part of that that view from from the street. Maybe, Rachel, we had this discussion also. Uh, these elevations are, of course, uh, as you said, Nate, they're, they're sort of deceptive and because they're flat, there's no depth. Um, and I think, Raman, you alluded to that. The other thing that, to Rachel's point, if we were actually really drawing the elevations true with landscaping, planting, trees, um, all the things that Rachel described in front of this, I, I think would make a quite a substantial change in the overarching impression of the front. But to your point, Nate, we can certainly study this, but I just want to point out that the nature of these elevations are very abstract and they're very flat. I agree. Yeah, I, I understand that. The um, So one other thing that was um, Mr. Lee discussed and it's seen here is the um, new elevator protrusion. And so, you know, we can see it on an elevation, but it'd be great to know how, how visible is that? Just like the HVAC from an oblique angle on Amity whether you're, um, you know, south of it, uh, you know, east or west of it, or even on North Prospect Street, um, you know, how how does that look? And so, it's hard to get a an understanding of that. And I, I again, I don't know if it's if there's ways to take screenshots of a of a computer model and just um, have that ready next time, just so, you know, to me that's that's a question. So. Um, Thank you. We can start looking at that. And so I, I had suggested, I, don't, I had sent an email out to the commission. You know, I was looking at um, um, sometime in October. Um, so I, you know, I, you know, we have we have to kind of. I guess we should probably talk about that right now. What's a good date? Um, Nate, I sent you, hold on, I'm just turning off, uh, um, I sent you a email. I'm, I'm just uncertain of my mon Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday schedule, um, in October at this point, that's my only issue. Like all, all three of those days, I'm, I will have, I will have one conflict free day, but I don't know which one it is right now. So Nate, I, I apologize. I saw the email, but I didn't have time to go to back to my calendar to respond. So I can take a look, look at it, but there are those the only possible dates you're proposing or are there other dates for potentially um, proposed? Well, we have to continue to a date certain. So, I mean, a Thursday evening works well for me. Um, I mean, the issue is just, I also have a lot of other <laughs> uh, meetings and like, um, commitments in October. So, um, I mean, I know I'm just going to calendar right now. It's like, you know, does like, does, uh, I don't know, like the ninth or the 19th or the 16th, I, you know, Mondays or Thursdays are best for me just because I have meetings almost every Wednesday and every other Thursday that month. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't know. We, we have to figure that out though before we adjourn. So Nate, do you okay, want to yeah. re resend that email with your your Monday Thursday dates as as well, or, and we can respond to that? Or do we have to set we, the date now? We have to set the date now. The date okay. and time now. So um, yeah, th Thursdays would not be a conflict for me in October. Thursdays would work best. I can't Monday. I, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I think Thursday the nineteenth would work for me. I think I already responded, Nate, 
and uh, Robin and I, I'll meet whenever. Yeah, I don't have any conflicts on any Thursday. I know either. time is very critical. Mm -hmm. so, Should we say the 19th, Nate? We can ask the library, but that, I mean, that's works for me. Okay. Yep. So, FAA people, Tim, does that okay, date, uh, Rachel, does that date work? It does. I, I would like to point out that it's quite possible that we will be presenting to the planning board on the 18th the day prior. Um, so I don't yeah. know if there's an advantage to have this meeting prior to that meeting. So is, is the 9th another date that you're proposing, Nate? The 9th is a Monday, which could possibly be a conflict for me, and I just don't have any way to know. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, the planning board review, you know, it's a site plan review application. I don't, I don't really see that they need to be sequenced in any order. Um, I'm imagining that the planning board will continue it for a, another evening. Mm. Uh, just that it's also, a, there's a lot happening. Um, I mean, the 19th seems fine. We could say 6.30 and this would be probably the only thing on the agenda. So, you know, I emailed the commission. We also have other business. So hopefully we can have another meeting in October, but the 19th would be dedicated at this point to just this project again. Okay. okay. And Nate and, and, and Robin, would the meeting would begin at 6.30 with the expected end at what time? I mean, we're going to about 9.30, so I'd say 9.30. I mean, okay. to be fair, I'd like to, it would be great to move through the, you know, we, we did the site, but maybe some clarifications, the existing building, and then the addition, and then see where we can get with, a, you know, a decision of, by the commission that evening, and great. then public comment. So. Great. Thank you. Okay. I guess we need a motion for that. A oh, motion to continue the meeting? Yes, to the 19th at 6.30. Okay, so uh, I move that we continue this meeting uh, to the 19th at 6.30. 19th, uh, I second it. I can second uh, so, it. Yep, yep. So uh, voting, uh, Hetty? Now we're voting on the motion. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Hetty? Mm -hmm. I just need a vote. Uh, your vote on the motion. I called on you um, first. I can. I vote in the affirmative. Okay. Aye. Uh, <laughs> aye. Aye. <laughs> uh, Michaela. Aye. Uh, Antonia. Affirmative. Pat. Affirmative. And I vote uh, aye. So we are approved for the meeting uh, to continue the hearing to the 19th, uh, 6.30, with an end time no later than 9.30, I guess, or aiming for no later than 9.30. That works. And so there's still 11 attendees. Um, I'll just say that you can always submit written comments to myself, and they'll get posted online and distributed to the commission. So if we receive more, I'll also send those to the, um, to the library team as well. Okay. So do we need a motion to, to close the meeting? No, I, I mean, we're keeping so. the hearing open. We just voted to continue it. So I, I you know, I think we're all set. If, uh, okay. Okay. So thank you. Th thank you, Nate. Sure. Thank you, commission members. Really appreciate your attention and help. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Especially you, Nate. <laughs> sure. Thanks. <laughs> Have a good night.